exposed and your legs exposed will give you all the vitamin D that you need. And it will help you uh, to produce melatonin, which you need to sleep well. And then we need to feed our brain, like I said, with oxygen, fresh air, uh, with sunshine. We'll talk about oxygen later. And we need to feed our brain with water. Now, there are more than one way of doing water. You're all drinking your water, am I correct? Eight to ten glasses a day or more, right? Uh, research confirms that subjects who are passively warmed in water just before going to bed have improved quality of sleep. So if you ever have trouble sleeping in the evening or unstressing, a very good thing to do is to fill your tub with water, with warm water, about um, 102 to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. It's kind of a lukewarm body, a little above body temperature. And if you want, you can get a thermometer. But it's kind of lukewarm, not too hot, because that will be too much, but just warm. And you sit in the tub for 30 minutes. And you know, studies have shown that people who do this nice, warm, relaxing tub bath for 30 minutes, they have improved tension, reduced tension, improved anxiety, and decreased anger, hostility, and confusion. It just kind of calms you down. So we want to feed our brain with smart nutrition. Let us review what is smart nutrition. What are the foods that are good for the brain? I want you to participate. What is the first one? Whole grains. So we need grains for smart brains. OK, remember that. Whole grains for smart brains. And then legumes, like this gentleman was telling us about. He had tried all kinds of legumes. Name me some legumes that you, you have been eating. Navy beans, excellent. What other kind of beans? Garbanzo beans, right? What other type? Lentil, split peas. Today, um, Mrs. Burek, she prepared a delicious uh, split pea soup, which is not in your book, but uh, we have a recipe for you, and that's one of our favorites. It's very hearty, delicious split pea soup. So soybeans and black beans and lima beans, th that is smart nutrition for the brain. And then we have fruits and vegetables. And we have omega-3s. Who remembers what were the sources of omega-3s? Raise your hand. Flaxseed, oh, OK. Walnuts, what else? Kiwi fruit, chia seeds, and canola oil, green soybeans, spinach, avocados, and almonds. So you review your, your paperwork later. You want to feed your brain with omega-3s. Then you need folic acid to prevent depression. And that is found where? Who remembers where folic acid was found? Again, in your legumes, garbanzos, black-eyed peas, lentils, and kidney beans. Then we need tryptophan. What does tryptophan do, remember? Tryptophan is a precursor needed to make serotonin which is a neurotransmitter that makes us happy. And tryptophan has to be brought into the uh, body by our diet. And what are the high sources of tryptophan? Do you remember? Pamin? Peas? The B vitamins, that's true. But specifically, we're talking for the tryptophan, the tofu, pumpkin seeds, gluten flour, sesame seeds, and almonds. And then we need B12, which we will get a little supplement under the tongue, the twin lab, right? And we need antioxidants and phyto... <laughs> ...possible to avoid. They are in the bad air that we breathe, the unhealthy smog-filled air in the food we eat, especially if we have a high-fat and high-sugar diet, in the air pollution, and even in the water we drink. And so um, our body makes some of these free re uh, 
radicals, and some of them are needed for our bodies, normal cell function. However, what happens, it, it makes, when it makes too many of these free radicals, and there is a damage that is done to our body that is pretty bad. You can think of free radicals in a practical way. Uh, imagine rust attacking metal. You've seen, you've had a piece of metal, and you let it sit in the rain, and it ages, and what happens? It gets rusty, right? And so after the rust gets greater and greater, this piece of metal is weakened and decayed until it no longer can be used. So these free radicals, in the same way, they do damage to our body. Cells and organs are weakened by oxidation of free radicals. So a decade of this damage of free radicals affects our brain. It causes us to lose memory. It causes <coughs> diseases such as cancer, heart disease, memory loss, premature aging, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. So that's the bad news. Everyone talks about free radicals. However, the good news is that there are antioxidants and phytochemicals in our food which help to prevent and repair the damage done by these free radicals. And the antioxidants in enhance our immune system, and they help improve our memory and mood and learning, and aid in preventing memory loss and improving attention span. So they're wonderful, these phytochemicals and antioxidants. And antioxidants can be found in our food, uh, such as beta carotene, vitamin A, C, and E, selenium, zinc, copper, manganese, and other phytochemicals. So. Let's look at phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are plant chemicals, and they provide color, texture, and flavor to the foods that we eat. So I have here a lot of phytochemicals. Here's the phy phytochemical pharmacy right in front of you. Remember what Hippocrates said? Let food be your medicine and medicine your food? Well, this is the medicine cabinet right here, loaded with antioxidants, loaded with phytochemicals. And phytochemicals provide the color of all our different foods, the texture and the flavor. And they protect the plant while it is growing. They enhance our immune system and reduce the risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure. There are 25,000 phytochemicals in our food. Isn't that amazing? It amazes me how still there are some people who go to a drug store or to a herbal shop and they want to buy phytochemical pills in pill form. And you can buy them, they're pretty expensive, but nothing comes close to the way they were packaged beautifully in our apples, in our pears, in our fruits and vegetables, just to the perfect amount. So if you go and get an um, supplement at the health food store, you may be getting one while you're missing 5,000 others. So this is your pharmacy. This is where you enrich yourself with these wonderful phytochemicals. So how are we going to get these phytochemicals? Do I have to count? Am I getting this phytochemical or that out of the 10,000, 25,000? No, it's very simple. You eat 5 to 13 servings of vegetables and fruits a day, depending on your size. If you're a kid and if you are a very small person that maybe weighs 100 pounds, you would maybe have five fruits and vegetables. But if you're bigger, like most of us, anywhere from five to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables a day will ensure that you get all these wonderful phytochemicals. So that translates about two and a half to six and a half cups of uh, fruits and vegetables per day. Do you know how much the average American eats as far as fruits and vegetables? Less than a one and a half servings of vegetables a day and less than a fruit a day. Was anyone part of this group? Raise your hand. <laughs> Don't be shy. Before you came to this class, was anyone part of this statistic? No, one person. OK. Well, good. So you all were doing better than the average American. So that's. Excellent. 
Now, let's talk about turmeric. Even our herbs and spices have um, special health benefits and antioxidant. This tiny little powdered uh, herb, it's called turmeric, and they use it in Indian food and, um, you know, just a half a teaspoon or a quarter of a teaspoon in some little dish. Look at the power it has. It, it has an antioxidant called curcumin. And this, the power of this little um, flavoring, uh, turmeric, is it has anti-inflammatory power. It relieves symptoms of arthritis, inhibits some cancer and tumor growth, prevents the loss of synapses between brain cells, and decreases the protein and plaque deposited in our brain. Now, only a creator could make something so tiny but so powerful. A little bit of this powder, a qu one eighth of a teaspoon, a quarter of a teaspoon, but such powder, power. So we have um, Mrs. Suresh Kumar. She's from India, and she made a beautiful dish of rice with half a teaspoon of this turmeric. So you'll be able to try it, and it gives it a beautiful yellow color, and it is powerful for you, as you can see, a tiny little turmeric spice. So we talked about feeding the brain. Now we want to um, protect the brain from brain drainers. And what are the brain drainers? Alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, sodas, and regular drinks of sugar, even fruit drinks. Overeating. Remember we talked last week that people who overeat don't live as long. They start losing memory. So it's always good to get up from the table when you could have one more piece of pie or one more piece of bread. Stop yourself and just get up. And remember the researcher we talked about who did the research on animals? He was so convinced of his research that he fasted once a week so he could live long <laughs> and have a healthy brain. So overeating brains our dr uh, uh, drains our brain. Snacking between meals. You know, our intestinal organs are like a machine. And there are some people who graze all day. I had patients who would tell me, you know, I, you really can't help me or teach me anything because I'm a grazer. I eat from morning till evening. And I thought to myself, and later I would explain to them, you're poor digestive organs. You're working them nonstop because you know, if you take um, any kind of machine, if you work it 12, 14 hours a day, it's going to break much faster than if you give it periods of rest. So we discourage snacking, but that you, and the way you make sure you don't snack, you eat a very good breakfast. Remember we talked about that? And you eat a good-sized lunch and a small dinner, and there will be no trouble snacking. And then you brush your teeth when after your meal, and that will be sure, no snacking. Multitasking. Have you seen these young people these days? They are text messaging. They're talking on the phone. They're, you know, they have uh, their iPod in their ears, and they're doing five things at once. And sometimes we think, you know, these kids, they're super, <laughs> super uh, smart to be able to do all this at once. Well, a study came out that people who multitask, who do too many things at once, they really don't do that well. It's not good for their brain cells, and they get confused, and their memory goes. So it's not a good thing to uh, multitask. It's good to do one thing at a time, just like we were designed. I think with all this gadgetry, the temptation is there to multitask, to watch TV and to be text messaging and doing your homework, and y w that's not the way to be. If you want to prevent your brain from getting old and forgetful, then do one thing at a time. And then artificial sweeteners is another brain drainer. So, you know, we live in a society that people don't like to exercise, yet they like to take it easy, including children. Even they're not able to exercise sometimes because a lot of schools are cutting out exercise programs and PE, which is too bad. But you know what happens if we don't use it? What happens? 
we lose it. And this fellow will sure lose it because here he was raking leaves and he just gave up in desperation, <laughs> being overwhelmed. So we don't want to be like that. Let's look. What are the hazards of inactivity? There are some slides here that are different. The hazards of inactivity, we have heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, where your bones get brittle and they break easily, cancer, anxiety and depression. They did uh, research and they found out that regular exercise workouts may help soothe deep sadness as effectively as antidepressant medications. Isn't that powerful? Then the nice regular exercise program, whether you walk or jog or swim or bicycle, if you do this on a regular basis, five days a week for at least 30 minutes, they are so powerful that they may soothe your sadness as effectively as antidepressant medication. Now, I'm not saying get off your antidepressants by any means, but I'm saying they do work according to studies and according to people who have been helped. Uh, exercise is helpful in treating anxiety, panic disorder. Regular exercise is an important aid to mental health and stress control. All of us have stress. All of us have uh, too many things to do and deadlines, and we all need to be relieved by exercise. They did a study by the National Institutes of Health, and this was a large study of 1,900 women. Now, women who exercise only occasionally or not at all have two times the risk of developing major depression within three years compared to those who exercise moderately at several times per week. So especially for women, I encourage you, it's very, very important to exercise for your mental health. Very, very important. Regular aerobic exercise fights depression. It increases serotonin levels in the brain, which is one of those neurotransmitters we need to be happy. And it's a as good a medicine as medicine for reducing depression. It is better than counseling for reducing depression, and it alleviates anxiety, substance abuse disorders, and even ADHD. How many poor children are given Ritalin without trying other natural methods, such as exercise? It prevents and treats depression. So exercise prevents depression, and if you have depression, it treats it. So it's wonderful. It's a wonderful medicine. Now, what kind of exercise and how much? Well, it should be aerobic exercise, which means it requires uh, the rhythmic motions of large muscle groups. And this would be walking, cycling, jogging, swimming, skiing. Recently, we had so much snow. If you went skiing, that would be an excellent aerobic exercise. Now, how much? There's a f and how, what, uh, how much should we do it and how often? Uh, we use the FIT formula for frequency three to six times a week. If you want the best benefit, then I would say five or six times a week. Intensity should be 60 to 70 percent of your uh, total VO2 max, but we d I didn't bring a formula for you to figure that out, what your pulse should be, but I will say that the intensity should be that you can walk and talk comfortably. If you're able to walk and talk, then you're doing good. So as soon as you start feeling you're exercising and you're able to walk faster, go faster if you're still able to talk and not be out of breath. So we use that as a talking test for the intensity. And the time should be 30 to 60 minutes per each exercise session. Now, there was interesting research that was done that practical exercise has additional benefits. Gardening, tending to flowers, chopping wood had more benefits than even walking or other aerobic exercise. Do you know why? Can you 
Yes? Why? Pamin? You're out in the fresh air, you're getting the sunshine, right? But let's say you're walking or you're doing those things too. When you are exercising with your hands, your mind is also actively engaged. Your thoughts aren't wandering. You're thinking, wow, I'm going to make myself this beautiful garden. And when summer comes, we're going to have great vegetables, you know. And, or I'm, I'm making this beautiful flower bed. Being outside in green nature is very refreshing, very relaxing, very calming. So uh, uh, they have done studies with children. They have some schools now where they encourage to have a garden program, a gardening program for kids. And they're saying it is so powerful that the kids have better attention spans, better memories, better grades, practical. I, I read another, uh, there's so much research I read, I can't share it all. Another research that our generation of youth are losing to work with their hands. You know, they know how to work with computers and, and <laughs> cell phones and iPods, but they don't know how to make things and do things with their hands. So I encourage you, you know, those of you who have some space to have a garden, include your children in it, make it fun, a flower garden, a, a fruit and vegetable orchard and, and garden, powerful therapy for the whole family, mentally and physically. So let's look at the mental benefits of exercise. It improves a sense of well-being. How many of you experience that? Do you feel great when you exercise? I feel on the top of the world. Increases energy, efficiency, and endurance. Break a sweat. How many of you sweat when you exercise? <laughs> Good for you. You know, some people don't like to talk about sweat, but sweat is very good. They have found r in research that people who break a sweat get, get the greatest benefits for their mood and their mind and their brain. You know, uh, I'm not sure why, but it gets all those toxins out, okay? And skin is one way of eliminating those toxins. And then we're getting all that fresh oxygen in. So make sure you break a sweat and enjoy it. It reduces stress. It improves the quality of sleep. <coughs> More exercise benefits. They never end. It, exercise next to food is the greatest thing you can do for yourself, the greatest gift you can give to yourself. It increases HDL cholesterol. Many people have a low, a good cholesterol, a, a, col a Cholesterol, uh, good cholesterol, HDL of less than 40 is very bad. You want it to be 60 or more. And the way, the best way to increase your good cholesterol is to exercise. Um, some people have 60. Mine was 93 the other day. And I was just shocked. And, and so were the, my, my doctor. He didn't know it could go so high. So I guess I'm exercising a lot. And what that does, if your good cholesterol is very high and your bad cholesterol is low, it, it brings the ratio of heart disease very, very low. So it improves insulin sensitivity. If you're a diabetic, the exercise will help your blood sugar to <coughs> be more normal and you will not need so much insulin. You will uh, have be able to reduce your medication and even insulin by exercising. It decreases the risk of gallstones and improves fibromyalgia and helps to control osteoarthritis and also decreases the risk of certain cancers. So make sure you don't give up. You know, so many people start an exercise program, they get excited, they buy a new gadget, you know, New Year comes around or they buy, buy a membership to the gym and it lasts for a few weeks, they get discouraged. Well, make sure that you don't give up. This is especially important for people who are depressed because um, you will not feel the benefits in the first few sessions. It's going to take at least one week of daily exercise to feel the benefits. But to feel long-term benefits, it's going to take four to six weeks. You're going to feel really good. Sorry, four to six months 
of regular exercise to have wonderful, wonderful benefits. Now, what about, what should you do if you have tension? How many of you, like at work, you know, something gets really stressful and you have some deadline and you get very stressed or at home you come home and there's some bills or there's some bad news. What do you do when you have stress? Tell me. Yes. Okay, she rolls her shoulders. Any other? What are some other ways you cope with stress? Yes. That's true. That's a lot of people do that. Any other ways of handling stress? Uh, yes. You go to sleep. That's a good one. I like that. I, I like to take a shower. A hot and cold shower will really do it. It'll wake you up and you'll feel better. Well, here's another thing that we used to do in our home and we still do. When my boys were little, actually up to 12 years old, we were homeschooling. And, you know, boys and homeschooling, and they can't sit still very long. So after a few hours, they want to go and do something else, you know, or, or their brain just stops functioning. So we used to have a, send them on a grizzly run, and we lived in the mountains, and there were bears, and sometimes they saw bears. But we say, go for a grizzly, grizzly run around our area where we live. And you know, they will, at first I had to prompt them, but after a while they'll say, Mom, I better go for a grizzly run. This is not working. These math problems are just not sinking in. So you can go for your grizzly run. If you're home, you can go for a walk, for a very fast walk. You know what I was doing the other day? It was so cold, and I had worked too many hours on the computer at, at work, and I came, and I, I needed a grizzly run. So you know what I did? <laughs> I went up and down the stairs seven, ten times. <laughs> that did it. <laughs> now, I don't advise that to all of you older folks, but you can maybe walk up and down the stairs or go for a walk around your kitchen. But find some way where you can take that stress energy and divert it into something else. And the grizzly run is always the fun thing to do. And when you come back, you can laugh. Yes. Good. We will talk about some other ways when you're in a stressful situation what you can do besides the grizzly run. So how much calories will you burn? In 30 minutes, if you're a woman, you will burn less because you have a smaller body, lower metabolism. A man will burn more. Swimming, 114 for women, 144 calories for men for 30 minutes. Gardening. Now this is, you know, pretty heavy duty gardening, 126 to 150, some digging, some, it's not just pity pattering around. You know, uh, brisk walking, 165 for women, and for men, 213. Uh, biking, 177 and 213 for men. And chopping wood, 190 to 230. Now this is with an, one of those axe saws, what do you call it, axe? Axe, not with an electric, <laughs> um, chopping machine, okay? So, you know, there are other things you can do throughout the day besides your regular session. Everything you think, think active. What, I can, what can I do to be active? If I go to a hospital, I don't care if the patient is on the ninth floor, I always take the stairs, okay? And I try to count them, makes it more fun, okay? So you always want to take the stairs. You, you want to take a walk during your work breaks. In the morning, you have a break for 15 minutes, take a walk. Uh, wherever I worked, I found a few ladies, and we would go for a walk. It was the best time of my work day. You know, it was fun. We would talk, kind of relieve the stress, laugh, and then you go back. You have new energy, and y you produce more. So morning and afternoon breaks, and then park your car far from the store, and all those steps will count up t additionally to your exercise. Driving? Or drive in? Yeah, no. That's true. <laughs> 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 
Oh, drive through. No, n not the greatest thing. <laughs> not the greatest thing. Now, here are some tips to help you stick to your exercise program. Okay, you want to vary your exercise. You don't want to do the same thing every day because you could get bored. You know, it's easy to get bored. So, for example, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you may walk, okay? Tuesday, Thursday, you may do a treadmill or you may lift some weights. And Saturday, you may put an exercise tape. Like I have an exercise tape on, on the days that I, I think it's too cold or I'm too lazy to go. So I do the exercise tape. And even the exercise tape, there's very moderate, there's more intense. You know, so you vary your activity and have a plan of what you're going to be doing if one thing doesn't work out and it rains, okay? And the other thing is find an exercise partner. Some of the greatest memories of my walking is a, a friend I would walk with. And we, a, at one point where I lived, there was a neighborhood of women. There's four or five of us. We would get up at 6 in the morning and we would be walking. It was dark. You know, and it was very fun. It was a good, great time together. Later on, we lived in the mountains, and there was, I would go to this m mountain, which was 5,000 feet elevation. It was about a three to four, four mile hike. I would get up in the morning and take my dog, and we had the best memories and times to watch the sunset and to, to you know, really enjoy nature. Pardon me? The sunrise, yeah, the sunrise. We would go early in the morning. It's really powerful. And then, you know, there were times I even met a bear with a friend of mine, but that wasn't bad either. That was fun too. So exercise has to be fun in pleasant surroundings. If you live in a nice, quiet neighborhood, good for you. If not, go to a park uh, so where there's some green or, or some nature. B make it fun. Make it fun, make it a pleasant place where you exercise. Are you getting enough vitamin O? You know what is vitamin O? Oxygen, that's right. Deep breathing improves our mood. You know, we have a hundred trillion cells in our body, and each one of them has to receive a steady, fresh supply of oxygen or they will die. And oxygen is picked up in our lungs from the air we breathe and it's carried to our body by our red blood cells. And so one way to give our body an extra shot of or oxygen is to live in the country. If you have the opportunity to live in the country where there's not much smog, it's wonderful. It's a great place to live where there's a lot of greenery and, and rivers and seas and waterfalls or just, you know, a lot of uh, trees like cypress and s cedar trees, uh, the evergreen trees. They're very good because they have uh, posi positively oxygenated ions in the air which are very, very powerful for relaxing and calming. But if you don't live in the country, you can get an extra shot of oxygen by exercise, okay? And also by taking deep, slow breaths several times a day. So breathing exercises improve mood. If we have a low blood, blood oxygen level, it impairs our muscle function, it impairs metabolic function, and leads to mass muscle atrophy or dying of our muscles and diminishing. It leads to exercise intolerance. So it's really important for our muscles and for our brain that we get enough oxygen. And uh, there was a physician, a, a researcher by the name of Dr. Bernardi, and he tried to figure out how many deep breaths a minute should we take to get the maximum effect and to really increase the oxygen in our blood. And he found that um, three to six breaths per minute is really ideal. 
uh, breathing exercises encouraging slow deep breathing of six breaths per minute for one hour a day improves blood oxygen levels throughout the day and improves exercise tolerance in cardiac patient patients so you may think wow in one minute to take six breaths that's really hard but it's not that bad why don't you all stand up for a minute let's try to do some deep breathing just for a minute and I'm gonna time you and what you'll do you're gonna use your diaphragm muscle which is right here you're gonna open it up push against it and you're gonna take three slow breaths okay so and then when I I will say out that will be 30 seconds into the exercise and then you take another three slow to exhale okay so I, I'll be timing you to see if we can do this okay ready set go Okay, breathe out, slowly, as slowly as you breathe in. Okay, was that hard? No? Was that hard? Were you able to do it in six counts or did you breathe more times? No comments? <laughs> Are you alive? <laughs> oh, you're still doing it. Oh, okay, good. So you did longer. Okay. I don't want you to pass out. Okay, let's do it one more time, okay? <laughs> Just to practice. Okay, ready? Get set. Go. In. Out. Very good. Thank you. Sit down. So the the idea is to do this deep breathing, Dr. Nedley recommends, while you're exercising, your one hour of exercise or 30 minutes, when you're walking, you, you really practice this slow breathing because you're not doing anything else. And you do three in and three out slowly and just enjoy it. And when you wake up in the morning, stand in front of a window and deep breaths. And apparently doing this for one hour a day, you're going to oxygenate your blood so well that you're gonna feel better. Isn't that exciting? Something very simple as deep breathing. Now let's see what impairs deep breathing. Tight clothing, you know, some people love to wear tight clothing, but it's, it's not healthy. Tight clothing, like this guy, see he's squeezing his poor little stomach to nothing, <laughs> you know, and, and that's not likely for a guy, it's mo more for a lady to do, but you know, Poor uh, tight clothing impairs our breathing and our lungs, so it's not good to have tight clothing. One good rule is whatever you're wearing, you should be able to put your arms up, and if you can put it up, put them up, and you're still, you know, comfortable, then you're okay. Poorly ventilated room. Make sure you have enough oxygen in your rooms. When we sleep at night, we open all the windows. We shut the heater off, and we have nice thick covers, and so we are getting that fresh oxygen when we're sleeping all the time. And lack of regular exercise also impairs deep breathing. Poor posture. How's your posture? Let's see. Are you all s nice and your shoulders are back? Your tummy is tucked? You're sitting nice and forward. Shoulders are back. Spine is straight. 
No slouching. Slouching in a chair is bad for your breathing and for the lungs. And then, um, you know, check out your office where you work. Is your room well ventilated? Is there a window? Open the window. Dress a little warmer. Have you eaten a high-fat meal? High-fat meals also impair deep breathing by having too much fat, and if there's too much fat, the poor red blood cells are overloaded and they stick together, and so they're not able to deliver the oxygen to the different parts of the body. So you want to practice breathing slowly, like I said, when you're exercising and whenever you remember, when you go for your little walk at work in the morning and afternoon, that's a good time to practice deep breathing also. We want to talk about resting your brain with sleep and classical music therapy. This is very, very exciting. Music therapy lifts the mood. They did an interesting study to find out how music affects people and they gave them to listen to Ravel, Bach and Brahms. And while these people were listening to this music, they were asked to think about you know certain problems or issues in their life and as they were doing that the classical music together with trying to solve these problems improved their mood and reduced their stress they did 13 weeks of this study and they found that the people who were listening to classical music had uh, less fatigue and depression and better test scores. Let's look at some music therapy. Oh yeah, this is the one, the study I, I just told you about. I, they reported feeling less depressed, reported feeling less fatigue, and their cortisol level was improved and dropped. Let's talk about more music therapy facts. Mental health benefits of music have been well proven. Not all kinds of music is beneficial. Classical music has been found to be the most effective, even among those who did not know it or even prefer it. There are people out there who were in this study who did not prefer classical music. They didn't know much about it, but their mood was increased because classical music has that power to make us feel better. Let's see how. The music enters the brain through our emotional region, which includes the temporal lobe and the limbic system. So we have a beautiful uh, symphony here, and the music is entering the emotional region of our brain. And then from there, some kind of music tends to produce a frontal lobe response that influences the will, moral worth, and reasoning pow power. Now the music that influences our will and frontal lobe and our reasoning and our character is the classical music. And it's a positive effect. However, yeah, th yeah this is the same quote except it's with the symphony orchestra. This type of classical music affects our frontal lobe in a positive way. It affects our will, our choices, our moral choices and our reasoning. <coughs> now there's other kinds of music that is not classical, that evokes very little, if any, frontal lobe emotional response. And the people who listen to this kind of music um, have very little logical or moral interpretation. And this is rock music. The rock music has a negative effect on the frontal lobes. So the kind of music we want to play to our children is classical music. It's going to make them happy. It's going to make them calm. It's going to make them peaceful. And the scariest thing to me about rock music is when they did the research that the syncopated rhythm, the rhythm of the rock music, affects the brain in such a way 
that it bypasses the frontal lobe and our ability to reason and make judgments about it. So when we're listening to this kind of music, we cannot make a judgment. Is this good or bad? Or what they're saying, is it good or bad? It, it's like almost has a hypnotic effect on our frontal lobe. Its research suggests that like television, uh, rock music produces a hypnotic effect. <coughs> now they did some research for eight weeks on animals and they found that they played this rock music and classical music and then no music with rats. And the rats that listened to the uh, classical, uh, to the rock music, which was very soft in the background, it's not loud like some people play it these days, very soft, but it, it had an effect on their brain. And it, it, causes, it caused their nerve cells to sprout in a very abnormal way. It caused memory and learning problems. And the problem was the musical rhythm. The musical rhythm of rock music goes against the rhythm of the body. The body has a certain rhythm. Your heart beats at a certain level. Your blood pressure is at a certain level. And classical mu music harmonizes with the rhythms of the body, whereas the rock music goes against that. And it says here, uh, this harmonic rock-like music damaged the hippocampus and caused shrinkage of the frontal lobe. So the classical music benefits, it reduces anxiety, has profound effect on brain's rhythm and function, it increases relaxation, reduces the need for pain relievers in cancer patients and childbirth. If you play nice, beautiful, classical, calm music to mothers, they, they can um, have an easier childbirth without much pain and also cancer patient. It boosts socialization, decreases symptoms in disturbed, in inaccessible psychiatric patients. We're going to talk about sleep. Restful, regular sleep. Oh, by the way, how much music should you listen to? Dr. Nedley recommends that you listen to about one hour of classical music a week. Now, I listen to it every day, and it feels wonderful. But, uh, and while you're doing that, you can think about certain problems you have and you want to solve, and, and the music together with thinking things over really helps you come to some good solutions, and it's very, very beneficial. Classical music. Let's talk about sleep. Regular sleep is very important. As we get older, our ability to produce melatonin is decreased, and so we often have trouble falling asleep. Another reason is we're exposed to artificial light. Did you realize that being exposed to your television and to the um, computer right before bedtime is not a good thing? At least one hour before, it's good to shut your television and your computer and not to look at those screens and do something relaxing to prepare for bed. You'll sleep much better and fall asleep right away. You, don't, you want to stay away from artificial light. What are some things you can do to improve your sleep? In the afternoon or early evening, exercise outdoors or in the daylight. But also, I, I prefer to exercise in the morning, but whichever suits you best. Have an early light supper. I would say eat an evening meal three or four hours before bedtime. That way your meal will be digested by the time you go to sleep. If you eat your meal just before you go to sleep, guess what will happen? Instead of taking four to five hours to digest, the meal will take 10 hours to digest. So your, your food will be digesting all night long, double the amount. You'll get up in the morning groggy and tired. So if you want a good night's sleep, eat your meal early. Eliminate caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. Avoid burning the midnight oil. Going to bed before midnight, before 9 o'clock is twice, by 9 o'clock is twice as effective as going after 12. So you want 
to go e early, 9 or 10 o'clock, e uh, have e effective stress management technique. And we talked about the grizzly bear run. We'll talk, yeah, y you can take a break, like we said. Take some, if you're having some stress at work or at home, you know, go outside and take several deep breaths. That's also very, very calming. Uh, work reasonable hours. Don't overwork. Don't be a workaholic. Be temperate. Eliminate the clock in the bedroom. People who have trouble sleeping keep on staring at the clock. Sometimes they listen to the tick-tock, <laughs> and it's not a good thing, okay? So get rid of your clock. La as soon as you go to bed, you know, don't get up and do something or... Go to the, your bedroom should be your sanctuary. You don't bring any books or anything. You just go there and you go straight to bed. And you lie still after you go to bed. Don't get up to do something or pick up the phone. Best not to even have a phone in the ba bedroom if possible. And you want to avoid excessive daytime boredom. People who are bored during the day have a hard time sleeping at night. So keep busy during the day. And then have soothing music. I have, I have a tape that's really fun. I think it's Bach in the morning and Handel in the evening. And it's really good because in the morning, Bach wakes you up very slowly and then pieces get faster and faster and faster and then you're all up and going to go for the morning and the one in the evening starts out moderate and goes slower and slower and slower and you're out in no time. So you can get some nice, relaxing, soothing classical music or Hymns, hymns, I, I forgot to mention, but nice hymns are also very soothing uh, and very good for relaxation and positive thinking. Read, some s read your Bible or some spiritual book or pray. Excellent way to fall asleep. We talked about feeding our brain. We talked about oxygenating our brain. We talked about resting our brain. Now we want to talk about training our brain. Every time you solve a new problem or you learn a new skill, you are giving your brain a workout and making more um, new neurons or nerve cells. So what are some ways to train your brain? Read good books. Do crossword puzzles and Sudoku. Learn a new language. Learn to play an instrument. You know, there was a recent study that really got me excited because I play the piano. I'm not such a terrific player, but I love to play. A and one stress reliever for me, for any, how many of you play an instrument? Raise your hand. Two? Is that all? Come on. Three, four, five. Oh, yeah, we have some music teachers here, too. I know M Mrs. Jane, she's not here. We have some good violinists and good, you know, sometimes when I'm stressed or for no reason when I'm happy, I just go to the piano and I sing and I sing for an hour. Very good therapy, very good stress reliever. And if you can't play an instrument, l turn on a nice CD and listen to it. So I get excited when I read new, uh, research about music. You know, um, they did studies and they found that professional musicians have plastic brains. Now to have plastic brains is very good because this gives the brain a lifelong ability to reorganize itself and to adapt to new experiences. So musicians, uh, professional musicians are easily adaptable to new experiences. They have plastic brains. And Apparently, music training influences the brain to improve other mental abilities, such as memory. Did you know that l uh, putting your children, young children, to learn an instrument causes positive changes in their brain and that it's very good for them? It makes them uh, well-balanced. It helps them in their mood and memory. So um, if you have played... Anybody here played an instrument as a child or a teenager? Raise your hand. There, more hands are going up, two or three. You know what is the recommendation? Go dig your instrument out of the closet and start practicing. Or maybe take a few lessons if you need, or if not, just do it. And it's going to help you. 
to feel better. It's going to make those brain cells more plastic, more changeable, more malleable. It's just wonderful, wonderful. And if you can't, then turn on a nice Mozart CD or some other classical CD and enjoy it and pretend you're, or you know what, if you belong to a church, sing in the choir. Excellent therapy for your brain. We want to think positive. You know, there's a verse in the scripture that I like. It's Philippians 1.13. Right? Is it? Yeah, no. One thirteen, I think it is. Which says, I can do all things. I can do 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So there's no negatives. Everything's always positive. Avoid pessimism. They did a study. Po power of positive thinking is great, but it's also important not to think negative. Avoid negative thinking. Look at this guy. He's checking his checkbook, and he's going <laughs> crazy because things aren't balancing, and he's in the red 5,000s or who knows what. Think positive and say, you know, maybe I made a mistake. I've got to do it again. And if, if it's still true, well, it's only money. <laughs> now here's a favorite quote of mine that says, it is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings. And I didn't quote the rest of this quote, but it says, think courage, think hope, think faith, think I can do it. Think all the positive things you can think. It is important you want to be, to be friends. You want to have a friend. You want to have people friends. But it's not enough to have people friends. We need to have a friend who is much bigger than you and I. And the, the wonderful studies have shown that people who have an inner religious experience, and this is not only one study, but several studies have shown that a personal religious experience is effective in depression recovery. Now, there are some people, you know, that have a superficial experience, but this is truly a person who has a relationship with God and with a higher power, and that they're able to recover from depression in a much better and faster way. Going through the forms of religion without a firm belief is a little benefit. Your brain is so smart, <laughs> you can't trick it, you know? You can't say, oh, just by going to church, okay, I've done my duty. The brain knows if your heart is not really in it. It's, it's not the real thing. So it, it's encouraged by researchers that daily reading of scripture is recommended for improved mental health. You know, there's w one thing you can do, which I enjoy doing, Dr. Nedley recommends it, is to take the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a very good book because it has counsel on every single thing from A to Z. It has 31 chapters. So every morning, it's a short chapter. You know, you get up in the morning, you have your nice shower with the hot and cold <laughs> to wake you up, and then you read your Proverbs, and you get direction for that day from the king of the universe. It is wonderful, powerful. And then you can think about it while you're driving. What did I read about? You know, sometimes I, I, I take one or two key verses. What is he telling me? And I, many times of the day, I just go back and I remember, oh yes, I will do this today. Oh yes, it's such a comforting thought. So daily scripture reading is really good. Social support is vital. Having, you know, some people have lots of friends, yet they don't have close friends. You know, it's not just to have friends, it's to have a sense of belonging that improves our mood and mental outlook. So um, having family, having friends that really care about you, you don't have to have many, one or two, but people who really care about and people you really care for.
social support reduces risk of death following a heart attack. A busy social um, life does not guarantee a sense of belonging. There is a need of close family or and, cl and or close friends. And if you don't have neither, go and volunteer. Go help someone. And then you see there's many lonely people. And you can be a close friend to someone out there. Trust in God. You know, you are very, very precious. You are very, very priceless. You have a very, very great future. And there's some things that you cannot solve yourself. Just leave it in the hand of the Almighty God. He has the solution before you even ask Him. It's just letting Him go and letting Him take care of it and trusting Him completely. In review, this program that we talked about the last four weeks involves nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. And that spells a new start. It is my desire for each one of you here to have a fresh start in all these areas of your life and to begin anew and to be a new person. You're priceless to him, and he thinks a lot about you. And your body is his temple, and you want to take the best care of it. Then you will have a healthy and a happy brain. So if there are days when you forget or you are discouraged, remember this text. This is a very powerful text. And you can put your name. I can put my name. Why are you, Lillian, in despair? And why are you disturbed with me, within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Thank you very, very much. Um, I would uh, like to give you a gift. Um, it is called, my favorite book, it's called The Ministry of Healing. Is it here? Yes, maybe you could bring me one here. I would just like to tell you a few of my favorite chapters. I've read that book again and again because it summarizes a lot of that we're talking about. <coughs> Not in those very same words. There are two versions. I guess we didn't have enough of the same. One is called Health and Happiness, and the other is called Ministry of Healing, but they're the same book. And there's an excellent chapter there on mind cure, which talks about some of the same principles that we have discussed here. You know, how you can be happy we, and how to strengthen your mind in contact with nature, how to enjoy nature, diet and health, another favorite chapter, another favorite chapter, flesh as food. There's a whole section on the home. I encourage the mothers here. Uh, how to make, build a happy and a healthy family. There's a chapter on the mother, on the children, on the father. And there's a chapter in contact with others. How to get along with other people. And the last one, development and service. You know, you have all come here for a reason. I don't think it's by any chance a chance that you have come here and you have a mission. You have learned a lot. How many of you feel you've learned a lot? Yes. You have a mission to go to your friends and neighbors and to tell them what you have learned so that they can start feeling better and so that they can start enjoying some of the wonderful benefits that you have enjoyed. And you know what's going to happen. You know how it is when you teach. When you teach, you learn more, and you are more happy, and you are, you are encouraging those neural pathways in your brain to make it easier for you. Simple, but a pretty powerful. It made a really difference, made a difference for me. And what that is, is caloric density of foods. Understanding the amount of calories that, that there is in different types of foods. 
And when we understand that, then I think that we can make choices. So start off with water. I don't care whether you drink a little bottle, a big bottle, a gallon, a liter, or 35 gallons. How many calories? Zero, right? OK, so what's the limit? Do you have to limit? No, have plenty of it. So and then on the other hand, on the other end of the scale, we have the most caloric food. And uh, what is it? All right, let's say pure fat, either oil or uh, butter or margarine. How many calories per pound? 4,000. 4,000 calories per pound. All right, that's margarine right there. OK, that's not 4,000 in there. But Why uh, did you choose this jar? Why did I choose that jar? Interesting. Do you know what is the size of your stomach? Right. The size of our stomach is the size of our fist. But that's empty, empty, OK? Then when you eat, the, the stomach expands. And the size of the stomach, when it's full, it's approximately, for an adult, one quart. Ooh, one quart. All right? It kind of lays sideways. It's kind of a little bag, OK? And some people kind of expand it even a little more, right? OK, now, the, uh, there are certain things that we need to know, that we need to learn about satiety. That means filling full. And if, if, um, if you eat pure fat, all right, this is, this is how much you would need to eat in order to feel full for one meal, all right? So if I eat just fatty things, am I going to feel full? No, because it isn't full. And how many calories is that? All right. Uh, let's say for a fi about a 1,500 calorie um, um, a diet uh, a day, divided by three, around 500. So this would be, uh, let's talk about a, about a 500 uh, calorie a diet per, per meal, all right? Three meals a day. So for breakfast, you would have 500 calories of <coughs> margin. So this is, right here is 500 calories. And you're not full, and you're still hungry. But you match your, all your calories. See, that's why you get hungry. We eat very, very high density, concentrated food, and you're not satisfied. But this tastes good. And uh, so let's go now to, um, well, let's, um, all right. Huh? What? Which one? OK. Oh, yeah. OK. What about cheese? That's 500 calories of cheese right there. And I don't think it's very hard for people to eat this. In fact, I'm going to have to hide it, because I don't when, I'm, when I'm looking the other way, I don't want you to come and snatch it. <laughs> All right. Um, that really doesn't make you full. OK. So what we need, all right, what about, what is this, red meat? Red meat, liver, or some kind of a meat. Uh, that's 500 calories right there. Does that make you full? That does not make you full. So what is it that? So this is high in fat, right? It's low, it has no fiber. Remember, meat has no fiber. It has no water. So it's mostly fat and protein. That's why it has a low satiety va value and also low nutrients. So everything we showed so far has no, basically, no fiber. Uh, not much nutrition at all. And um, now, let's go into something very popular. Billions of people around the world eat rice. I know it's not a very common American, not the most common American food, but in Asia, in South, Central America, in Pacific, Africa, m India, people around the world eat rice one, two, three times a day. Guess what? You got 500 calories of rice in here. Does it fill up your stomach? Oh, now we found something here that fills up the stomach and it has only 500 calories. Now this is 
just ri uh, steamed rice with water and a little bit of brown salt. Brown rice. Brown rice, if yes. If you had white rice in the same amount, you would not be as full. Yes. Because it doesn't have much fiber. All right. Another very, very popular common food for many people around the world corn. is corn. Okay? This is 500 calories of corn. Does it fill up your stomach? Yes. I'm not suggesting that you have a whole, whole meal just corn, but some variety of corn, some variety of greens, and so forth. All right? Okay, now let me ask you this. If you wanted your corn with some butter, and you put, now here are four tablespoons of butter. And say you took um, two tablespoons of butter on your corn. How much corn could you eat and still maintain your calories? Half. Okay? If you wanted butter on your corn, you would eat half, and then you could have some butter, and that you would meet your calorie, but you're still not full. See? Get that point? That's very, very important. All right. What about another very, very common food around the world? Millions of people eat it. Potatoes. And people say potatoes are fattening. Is that true? No, that is not true. Potatoes are good food, and 500 calories of potatoes fills up a quart. That's, that's your calorie right there. However, again, the same story. If you want to eat potatoes with butter or, whatever, or you sour know, cream. sour cream, then you would probably most likely only be able to eat half. So it's not the potato that's fattening. It's what you put on it. Okay. Now, you know, um, in the <laughs> afternoon, when you feel the blues and you feel like having a little bit of snack, you just grab a handful of M&Ms. How many M&Ms make up 500 calories? That's it. That's it. What do you get in here? Do you get nutrition? No. Do you have uh, fiber? No. Antioxidants? No. You know what? No. Sure? Yes. You know what you get? You get sugar, and you get coloring, which is not good. And you got chocolate, which is not good either. And fat. Why and not? fat. And why does it taste good? Because of the sugar and the fat. There's a, I, we're not showing here ice cream, but ice cream has probably the, the combination of three ingredients that appeal to your taste, bud. Sugar, fat, and salt. And, the, uh, no. and, and this, why is this tasty? Why are people hooked on cheese? Cheese is actually a, um, uh, it's a, it's a food that, that people uh, are addicted to it. It's an addiction. People love cheese. Why? Because of the fat and because of the salt. Okay, so now, um, okay, what are the vegetables? First. Yes, so actually, let's see how, many, how much vegetable can you eat that, that makes up 500 calories, all right? We couldn't, oh, by the way, we have. I have an empty quart here. I couldn't fit all the vegetables into this quart that would make up 500 calories. Therefore, we had to get a basket. I'll need, I don't know, three or four quarts. That's 300 right there. More? More? All right. Okay. So, and even more. Okay. You have a big enough basket for us. Right. Husband. So you see, you can eat all of these vegetables, and now you have 500 calories. And, and there's no way you could eat all of this in one meal. So what's, what is the secret then? To losing weight, right? To, to actually ma losing weight, maintaining your weight, having just a, the right weight. You, you eat a whole bunch of vegetables, and you eat... Um, Make this your entree. Make yes. the vegetables your entree. Then, of course, you eat some rice and so forth, or, or whole grain bread, the whole grain pasta, mm -hmm. the beans, and so forth. And then you're going to, can you have a little bit? Oh, maybe a little bit. One tablespoon, one teaspoon, for the maybe. Whole day. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. All right. Now okay. What about a fruit, fruit. Okay, so as far as the fruit, you could have. An orange, 
You could have kiwi. Uh, sure, let's have two. You could have a um, nectarine. And how about a banana? What do you think? Well, not, enough. not enough? What about an apple? Yeah, a, nice big one. a nice big apple. A few, a few grapes. All right. Now you're talking about you're pretty close to 500 calories. You understand now? Yeah. See? Now this is bulky, full of nutrition. Is there nutrition in here? No, what's in he here? A lot of fat. And okay, fine, flavor, right? Okay, yes, you can get used to this kind of flavor here and even th this. Just have to train your taste buds. <coughs> good, thank you so much. All right. Very, very good. And you know, you have learned to make some delicious uh, cream sausages and the vegetables. Those are the ones that are Oh, uh oh. like to finish by talking about a rainbow of color. We have a rainbow of color. We said that the rainbow of color is what gives us the phytochemicals and the antioxidants that makes them so very, very powerful. Look at all these beautiful designer colors. They come from our creator. And let's start with the reds and purples. These are powerful right here. We have here some blueberries and red apples, and we have red cabbage, and we have red plums, and pink grapefruit, and beets, and red pears. They have a um, phytochemical called anthocyanin, and these foods are especially protective for your heart. So if you have heart disease or you, if, if you have clots that are forming inside your body or in your arteries, they will be dissolved by eating these type of vegetables because they dissolve the blood clots. And they also uh, help with heart disease and stroke. And red, uh, the red vegetables. Here we have tomatoes and watermelon and the pink grapefruit. They have a very special uh, antioxidant called lycopene. And this is a cancer fighter. These are cancer fighters. They fight especially prostate cancer. And it's important to have some cooked tomatoes every day because there's something about cooking the tomatoes that really makes the lycopene very powerful as a fighter of cancer. Then we have our yellow-green vegetables, such as our avocados, and our corn, we don't have any corn here, but yes, we do. It's right here. Our corn, our kiwi fruit, our yellow peppers, and our sweet potatoes, and our bananas, and our grapefruit, and uh, honeydew melons. And in the same group, we also have lettuce. Lettuce is part of this group. and collard greens. The nice thing about collard greens, they fit in more than one group. Collard greens are part of this group. And mustard greens, I didn't have any. Turnip greens. And these are very powerful in lutein and zeaxanthine. And they fight cataracts. They're good for your eyes. They fight macular de degeneration. <coughs> for women who ate most of these type of vegetables, they had a lower incidence of diabetes. They were able to control their blood sugars. And also, they were protected from uh, certain cancers. Now, what about our green vegetables? They are powerful, powerful. They have several antioxidants. One of them is isocyanates, sulforaphane, gl glucosinates, indoles. They protect against cancer, colon cancer, stomach cancer, a prostate cancer, especially the aggressive form of prostate cancer. These are very powerful in uh, protecting us from that. And if we have it to help uh, lower uh, our chances of dying, 
They're good for heart attacks and also to protect us from strokes. And then we have our yellow, uh, dark, green, and orange vegetables. These are your apricots. We don't have any here, but cantaloupe and uh, sweet potato, winter squash, dark green leafy plants. Some of the dark ones from there come here also. They have beta carotene. They're good for your eyes and for your skin, to have beautiful skin, and also protect from different cancers. And then we have grapes. You know, grapes have a powerful antioxidant, which is called polyphenol, and it is very, very good in um, decreasing our blood pressure, increasing our good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, and also reducing our blood from being sticky and not forming blood clots. So red grapes and grape juice are very, very good for you. So our creator has provided us with an abundance of delicious and nutritious food that is good for our health, for our body, and for our brain. So all we have to do now is to enjoy it.